Welcome, this is Professor George Adams again with a demonstration which shows you beating in a two degree of freedom system. The system is called the Wilberforce Spring or Wilberforce Pendulum, uh, named after Lionel Wilberforce who invented this way back in 1896. And what it is, is as you can see a mass at the end of a very long spring and it has, of course, one degree of freedom associated with vertical motion. I'll pull it down and let go. And you can see it oscillates up and down with a characteristic natural frequency of roughly one hertz, a bit less than one hertz. But at the same time, I can give this a rotational displacement and let go and it oscillates in the rotational mode. And this, this uh, spring, along with the mass at the end, has been, uh, has been designed so that those two frequencies are very close together. And when you have two frequencies very close together, as you may know, you tend to get a beating phenomena where as you'll see, energy will be transferred back and forth between the translational mode and the rotational mode. Now, and of course, in order to get the beating, you do need some coupling between the translation and the rotational mode. And that coupling is supplied automatically by the spring. You can imagine where if you extend a spring, you really are tending to uh, twist the coils somewhat. Now, uh, let's see what happens. I'll give this a translational displacement. Let go. At first it oscillates mainly up and down, but with time it seems to be rotating more. So some of that energy from that translational mode is being dumped into this rotational mode. And with enough patience, uh, we'll see that more and more energy goes into rotation. And wait a little bit longer. Let's see. More and more rotation, less translation. And pretty soon it's not moving very much in the vertical direction anymore. In fact, right Right now, it's moving relatively little, right? In the vertical direction, all that energy is in that rotational mode. But what happens now? Well, it seems to go back, right? It beats back into the uh, translational mode. Right now, we have rotation and translation, but we'll wait a bit longer and we'll see that there'll be less and less rotation, more and more of the vertical translational mode. And if we wait long enough, we should get back more or less to the starting point where it was basically just oscillating vertically with very little rotation. Of course, there is some damping in the system, right? So we won't get back exactly to the initial state but uh, we haven't really lost very much energy, right? Right now it's oscillating basically just vertically, very little rotation, and now it starts to go back into the rotational mode. Okay, and you can imagine that if I started off with a rotational displacement rather than starting off with a translational displacement, I'm starting with a rotational displacement and let go. What happens? Well, I think you might expect that that energy from the rotational mode would gradually beat back into the translational mode. And we'll need a little bit of patience here, but uh, it will eventually beat back into mainly translation with very little rotation. Now what I'll be showing you on a PowerPoint slide is a somewhat different system, but still a system which exhibits uh, beating. And we'll have two masses, 
connected to each other by a spring with an additional spring connected to ground on this side and another spring connected to ground on this side. You'll see the uh, configuration in the slide, but we'll find that there are two modes of vibration, one in which both masses move back and forth with the same frequency and the same phase, and the other mode in which they move in opposite phase to each other, but still in synchronous motion, that is to say, with the same frequency. And that system, it's a little bit easier to analyze mathematically, and we'll show how that exhibits beating. So here we have a schematic of a two degree of freedom system. As you can see, there are two masses, x1 and x2, each of which have the same mass m, each of which are connected to ground through a spring of stiffness k, and connecting those two masses to each other is a coupling spring, which I call k sub c. Now, as we said briefly uh, a little while ago when we were talking about the Wilberforce spring, uh, one mode of vibration is to have these two masses, x1 and x2, moving with the same frequency and the same amplitude and in phase with one another. Now, you can imagine that if these two masses are moving up and down with the same amplitude, same frequency, and in phase with each other, then what is this coupling spring doing? Well, it's not doing anything, right? When the top mass moves down an inch, the bottom mass moves down an inch. When the top mass moves up an inch, the bottom mass moves up an inch. So that first mode of vibration uh, has a frequency equal to the square root of k over m. Namely, it has a natural frequency which is independent of the stiffness of the coupling spring because the coupling spring is not doing anything. And that first mode of vibration then is characterized by the amplitudes of mass 1 and 2 being equal. Hence, x in the first mode is this vector 1, 1. Now, second mode, things are different. Suppose we ask the question, what would happen if both masses moved up and down with the same frequency and amplitude but opposite phase. So when mass x1 moves down an inch, x2 moves up an inch, and so forth. When x1 moves up an inch, x2 moves down an inch. Well, in that case, what happens to the coupling spring? It's being compressed and stretched symmetrically, and a point in the middle of the coupling spring is stationary. So it's just as if that point in the middle of the coupling spring was uh, connected to ground. In other words, it's just as if the coupling spring were cut in half and that half spring were connected to, to ground. And as we know, and it does seem counterintuitive, if we take a spring and chop it in half, its stiffness actually doubles. And that's because in order to get this, the uh, same displacement, you would need twice the force because the spring is, is uh, half the length. So the second mode is characterized by uh, masses one and two moving up and down with equal amplitude but opposite phase. And that second mode of vibration is uh, square root of k plus 2kc over n. Now there's a sim simple trigonometric identity. You can either add, say, the sine of omega 1t to the sine of omega 2t, or you can subtract them. Uh, in this case, we decided to subtract them, and this is just a trigonometric identity. But if we define omega to be the average frequency, and epsilon to be one half of the difference between the two frequencies, we can rewrite this streak identity in a different form. And in this form, you'll see it has a sine epsilon t and a cosine omega t. Uh, 
And if we take the case of weak coupling, such as what we had in the Wilberforce spring, where Kc is much less than K, the spring that couples these two masses is much less stiff than the main springs are, then of course you see that omega-1 and omega-2 are very close to each other, not identical, but very close to each other, and hence epsilon, the one half the difference frequency is much less than omega. Now what does that mean? Well, if epsilon is small, you basically in this term have a cosine omega t whose amplitude is varying as a sine curve. Because epsilon is a small number, so the sine epsilon t varies slowly compared to cosine omega t. And we'll see that in the subsequent graph. Now, here we have a sine and a, well, two sine curves of slightly different frequency. And we're going to subtract them from one another. Now, as you'll see here, initially, the uh, two peaks are aligned with each other. So when you subtract these curves, you'll get essentially zero or close to zero. But if you go down uh, after oh, 10 or so peaks, you'll see you'll re reach a point where the trough of the sine 20 t curve uh, coincides with the peak of the sine 21 t curve. And now when you subtract those two, they reinforce each other. Namely, uh, when you combine sine 20 t and subtract from it sine 21 t, you get a curve like this, which is consistent with how we described it before. Namely, we get a basically a cosine curve with a frequency omega, where omega was the average of the two frequencies, the average of 20 and 21. And the epsilon is a small number, and the sine epsilon t acts as a amplitude which varies sinusoidally with time. So this illustrates the mathematics behind this beating phenomenon. Thank you.